Hi everyone, this is our 26th lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the price and the demand relationship, the time value of money, uh, then single cash flow, and after that, uniform cash flow. We're going to start with price demand uh, relationship. So price and the demand relationship, um, usually in this class, we usually uh, look like this, right? Uh, consider it something like this. So this basically shows the price elasticity, price elasticity basically means that when the price increase, the demand decrease, or, you know, otherwise, um, or you know, from another relationship, if the demand increase, the price decrease, right? This is called a price elasticity. The reason we call it that is because, you know, think about it, usually this is what happening, right? You really like donut, right? You really like a donut. And then usually donut is like, you know, 12 cents for three, right? You can get three, three of them. And one dozen is like one dollar from uh, Dunkin' Donuts, right? They're dirt cheap, dirt cheap. And then you can get it all the time you want. However, if it's increase, there are some very fancy brand of donuts. Um, they're very expensive, right? Um, some the 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 so-called uh, garment donuts. Um, some of them, some of them can be like three, four dollar for one. Well, if that's the case, you're probably not going to buy a, a lot, not going to buy a dozen, or maybe I don't know, maybe one once in a while and try it uh, to satisfy your hunger. Uh, but most of the time, you know, you won't spend, buy a lot, right? So usually that's a case. Of course, sometimes there is a, a situation. This is simplified version, right? Sometimes, you know, we do the test for some company, let's say Apple or Samsung, that mean keep increasing their, uh, the price tags of their phones, but they still sell a ton of them, right? The, 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 uh, the way they, um, you know, they, they can sell those phones it doesn't seems like violate the price elasticity uh, principle. Um, but in most of the case, it, it, it's like this. In a, a rational uh, market, the higher the price, the lower the demand, right? And then uh, based on the relationship, we can kind of write this relationship into equation which P, the unit price, equals to A, which is a constant, minus B, which is uh, an indeterminate constant, multiplied by D, D the demand, right? A and B, of course, varies for different products and for different companies. But, you know, this equation shows some universality, seeing that no matter what company you are from, what product you are selling, it always follow this kind of a universal pattern or universal law, right, follows something like this. Okay, if we know the relationship between price and demand, then we can actually do more. We can find out the total revenue. Total revenue, TR, is basically the product of the selling price per unit and the number of units sold. So TR here equals to P multiplied by D, right? Meaning that if you open up, let's say you really open up a donut shop, right? And each day you're going to sell 100 donuts. And for each donut, that's $3, let's say. You get $300 per day, right? That's your total revenue per day. That's how much you're going to uh, make per day, right? So that's the total revenue, all the money you get in every day. Obviously, we already know that from the previous slide, the equation P equals to A minus B D. So we put this part here, P equals A minus B D. So this becomes this part multiplied by D. And that equals to A D minus P D square. A D minus P D square. This 
you know, obviously it's a parabola, right? It's actually a parabola. So, uh, for a parabola, you can draw its, uh, the, the chart, draw the figure, and it looks something like this. It looks something like this. And for this, you already learned about this over and over a million times, probably in your middle school or high school, right? This is pretty easy to deal with. Um, this is uh, it's symmetric. So there's a middle point, right? There's the middle point. The middle point for this one, because there's negative before d square, uh, uh, there's a maximum value. The middle, middle point actually uh, going to help you to find the maximum value, right? The maximum value is here. And how do we calculate this? I'm not going to go detail, and I'm sure you did this so many times. Basically, d equals to a divided by 2b, right? And that's where you find the middle point. Uh, bring this middle point into the original equation, you'll find out the maximum value, maximum total revenue. And so the maximum revenue at the demand level is actually d hat equals to a divided by 2b, and then the, you can, based on that, find the maximum uh, total revenue. This is interesting because you can see that if we assume this relationship always holds, of course, it's just theoretical, right? In most of the time, uh, 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 it's going to a bit different from this, right? We know that, but we're not going to discuss that here. Assume that's correct. So it's actually interesting that with the increase of demand, your total revenue increase, 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 after a certain point, it starts to decrease. The total revenue actually going to decrease, right? So if you are going to open up a, a donut shop, you probably want to think about how many donuts I do plan to sell per day. Um, does it worth my time, my hours to make a lot more and try to sell more? Or I should just decide this is so many, 100 donuts is what I'm going to sell today. I'm just going to make 100. After that, I'm done. I'm not going to do more, right? So need to need to make that decision. That's for for uh, maximum revenue. So um, it's good we figure out that uh, we don't want to make as many demands as possible. Right, uh, so we can because we want to max. We want uh, the maximum revenue does not always increase, but a lot of times to think about, you know, our decision may not be based on maximum revenue because maximum revenue is the money you get in, but that's actually not the money you going to put in your bank, right? Because you actually need to pay for some cost. Let's say you rent this space, you rent this uh, store to make your donuts, right? Monthly, there's monthly cost. You need to use your revenue to pay for that before you can continue your business, right? Before you can make the rest of the money and put them in your pocket. Um, so that part, obvious, is a profit, right? You, what you really want to do is maximize your profit. And the, your profit may not happen at the point of the maximum revenue. Because when you make more revenue, yeah, here you have the maximum revenue here, but what if the cost is actually really high, right? When you use the maximum revenue minus the, the total cost, it's actually leave you a tiny, a small uh, profit. Right? Maybe you better stop somewhere here to make more profit, right? We don't know that. So how do we, we want to make our best decision based on profit? But that's basically what we're trying to do, how to find the maximum uh, profit. So, well, we already said that, right? To maximum the profit, we're basically trying to maximum total revenue minus total cost. We know that the cost equals to two parts add together, 
one is the uh, fixed cost the other is the variable cost right fixed cost let's assume it's always stay the same it's always stay the same see in this figure uh, we draw the fixed cost right no matter how the demand change the maximum cost stay the same oh, sorry the fixed cost stay the same right uh, the part then the part change is the uh, variable cost here we write the variable cost as CV multiplied by D all right D again is a demand right then CV is basically the variable cost to making each product each unit of the product right think about using the donut example again if you are making 100 donuts and you need to figure out so d equals to 100 right then you need to figure out to make each donut how much money that is you know the cost of sugar the cost of flour the cost of um um what what, what else in there uh egg milk right all those kind of things uh, you need to figure out what will be that cost right and maybe also your time to making it maybe the um the, the the electricity maybe the gas to make per unit of donut that be, will be your variable cost that will be your variable cost right so um this line here basically shows how the total cost starts to change when you have more demand when you start to adding variable cost at the beginning if you are making no donuts of course this part equal to zero so cf just equals to the uh, ct just equals to cf right the total cost equals to the fixed cost when you start adding more unit start making more donuts and then uh, the total cost starts to increase and it's a linear process it's a linear process right so that's uh, how we find the cost. And the, we already see that this is the curve of total revenue. This is line of total cost. Revenue minus cost basically gives you the profit. Basically gives you the profit, right? So you can see at the beginning, okay, this line goes way down here, right? At the beginning, the revenue is actually lower than the cost so you're not making any money you're actually losing money you're making negative profit right because no matter what you need to pay for the rent right you need to pay for a certain amount of money maybe you have a helper uh as long as he's he or she is in your shop you have to keep paying this person right so at the beginning you're not making any money then gradually when you start making more and selling more at one point who finally uh, the maximum uh, the, the maximum revenue curve meet with the line of the total cost here right now finally this is a break even point uh, cost equals to revenue and you finally break even right that's that's here now after that you are starting to making money after that you are starting to making money right the line if you draw a, a straight line here you draw a line here or maybe look at this uh, the revenue at this point at the certain demand the revenue minus the cost give you the maximum profit give you the maximum profit and then start making money you're gaining more profit getting more profit and keep gaining profit at one point oh my god it's going back it's become another break-even point you see the cost uh, line meet the curve of the total revenue again this is another break-even point within the two break-even point you are making profit after that you start to have loss again you start to uh, have loss again right now within this you can see that we have a we have from zero to zero we experienced increasing and then we experienced decreasing 
right? So at which point do we get the maximum profit? Right here, right here, right, right here. So the point where you are making the maximum profit is actually A minus CV divided by 2B. A minus CV divided by 2B. Remember, A divided by 2B give you the maximum revenue, but A need to minus the CV, which is a variable cost per unit, that's going to give you the, um, the, the demand, at which demand you're actually making the most profit. You're actually making the most profit. Now, if you see that this has nothing to do with CF, right? This actually have nothing to do with CF. The fixed cost doesn't really impact where this happen because it's a constant. It stays the same always, right? So this is how you, um, how do we get here? Try it yourself. Uh, we're going to talk about this tomorrow during the class, but definitely try this yourself. You can see where this comes from. That's the maximum uh, profit. Next, we're going to talk about the time value of money. How much, so basically how much, the question I, give, I ask you is how much $1 today is worth next year? How much $1 today uh, going to worth? next year if i ask you this question wh how, what will be your answer take a um, take a minute to think about it so how much is it worth nobody can say nobody can say right but generally speaking we think that money next money now worth more than money next year. Let's say you can put this $1 uh, into a high yield, let's say a high yield uh, bank account. There are a, a few high yield bank account, maybe from American Express, maybe from, I don't know, uh, Discover, or maybe from Addy, right? Those bank account, they, they can give you a pretty high, a relatively high, uh, interest, right? If you put money in their bank, right? So let's say the interest is 2% per year, right? If you put this money in now, then uh, the bank will, you know, uh, that's the agreement, the contract you have next year, after one year, you go back to the bank and you can get $1.02, right? Because 2% of $1. Uh, is of course two cents. So you got a one point zero two uh, dollar. So in next year, your one dollar actually was one point zero two. So that's that means that time. There's a time value on your money. There's a time value on your money. Today, money today is always worth more than money tomorrow. This again, of course, mainly because of the interest. That's what we said uh, from the example, right? Interest is a fee that a borrower pays to a lender for the use of his or her money. For the use of his or her money. Most of the time, you know, um, if you borrow some money from bank, maybe some of you uh, still have certain kind of a uh, student loan, or your company has got, you know, some kind of loan from, um, from bank, or if you buy a house, you need to pay the mortgage, right? Uh, you can, uh, you paying the, you are going to pay the money for the next 15 years or 30 years. And uh, the total amount you're paying definitely is not, definitely is higher than the dollar value the company give you. So there's an interest on that. Interest rate is basically the percentage of money being borrowed that is paid to the lender on some time basis. This can be one month, this can be one year, this can be one quarter, something like that, right? Principal, another term you probably heard 
before, the initial amount of money in transactions involving debt or investment. Involving debt or investment. Let's say you using a mortgage um, calculator again, right? An example again. If you borrow, let's say, uh, 500K from the bank to buy a house, that's the money the bank gives you. That's your principal, right? That's the debt you basically have. And then you need to pay all the interest are building on this principal and all the money you're paying back is towards to to cover all the principles and the 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 interest generated by this principal, right? And that's an uh, initial amount of money in transaction. Of course, it can also be that you have maybe one thousand dollar you want to start to invest, so you bought the uh, Tesla stock. Let's say, right? That's your principal as well, right? You put one thousand dollar in there and. Uh, let's say at a certain point you, you want to figure out, okay, am I losing my principal or am I uh, winning right from my investment? Um, interesting period is basically how frequently interest is calculated, right? Sometimes it's one month, sometimes it's one year. Uh, it's all, all different, right? It's all different. And uh, um, find out interest period is very important uh, because um, obviously um, I can say that your interest rate is 3% uh, but um, the 3% if that's for the whole year uh, the money you need to pay back is much lower than if I'm actually going to charge the interest period every three months so you're going to experience uh three percent of interest every three months that's a lot of money to pay back right and um, you can actually calculate how much that will be uh, for a year it's much higher than three percent right and then there's future amount of money basically that's a result from the cumulative effects of the interest rate over a number of interest period over a number of interest period Let's say you um, invest one thousand dollar into the stock market, and then each year you gain some more money because there's interest rate. Let's say each year you win ten percent, right? The st uh, Tesla stock increased by ten percent. Then after three years, you can calculate at that time how much money your one thousand dollar become. Right, how much money it, it it will be. So that's the terms related to interest. Um, the way to accumulate interest, uh, there are multiple methods. There's many many methods. Uh, one, the relatively simple one is simple interest. Right, it's called the name. It's called simple interest. So simple interest basically the total interest earned or charged is linearly proportional to the initial amount of the loan, which is principal, right? The interest rate and the number of interest periods for which the principal is committed. So total interest I can be found or calculated using this formula, right? This is your P is your principal, let's say $1,000, N is number of uh, interest period, maybe let's say, uh, let's say ten years, and then the interest rate is per interest period, let's say three percent, right? Let's say three percent. So, um, if you have one thousand dollar and the, the interest is applied as simple interest, then you have one thousand multiplied by ten years multiplied by three, that will give you. Um, basically uh, 1,000 multiplied by 0 0.3 equals to 300, right? So give you, after 10 years, you're going to get 300 more. So you get principal plus interest, you get $1,300. That's how much money you're going to have if the interest rate is simple interest, right? And uh, here's another example, right? 
If A borrowed $10,000 from the bank for a personal loan, the yearly interest rate I is 5%, right? So at the beginning, it's $1,000 at year zero. Year one, it increased by 5%. Then uh, increase another 5% by year two. So based on the principle again, and so on, so forth, so on, so forth, right? That's a simple interest. If you draw this, uh, if if you use this equation to draw this, you can see that it's a linear uh, increase. So that's why we call it uh, linearly. We say that the total interest is linearly proportional to the initial amount of the principal. So that what happens, right? Uh, and you can see this is straight line keep going up, but it's a straight line. However, in real world, most of the time it's not linear, right? Most of the time you probably heard about this compound interest, compound interest. Um, the interest basically compound interest means the interest charge for any interest period is based on the remaining principal amount plus any accumulated interest up to that period, up to that period, right? What does that mean? This means, okay, let's say at the beginning, you borrowed one sound a year and the interest amount for period, uh, for any period, any one year period is 10%, right? So, so after one year, the original money is 1,000, right? And then increase by 10%, the interest is $100, so 10 multiplied by 1,000, that gives you 1,100, right? 1,100. The amount at year end of year one is 1,100. Year two, however, instead of having this still as 1,000 to gain another interest amount of 10%, no, 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 no. You now, at the end of year one, you owe me not 1,000 anymore. You owe me this much, 1,100. So we actually move this number here. And then we add another 10% on top of this. So 10 multiplied by 1,100 give you 110. Then now, the money will be 1,100 plus 100. And 10, that gives me $1,210, right? That's at the end of year two, how much you are owing me. So this, of course, transfer to the beginning of year three. At this point, you owe me this much money. And again, for this year, I'm going to charge you 10% of interest, not on the $1,000, the principal, but on the $1,210 you're owing me now. So this plus this give us $1,331. And you can see this increase is compounding, right? This is not linear anymore. So future money here, F, actually equals to the principal or present value, principal multiplied by one plus I powered by n, one plus i powered by n. n is the number of n periods, and i is of course the interest rate, i is the interest rate. So in this one, you can say that future value, uh, to calculate the future value, we have 1,000 multiplied by one plus 0 0.1, 10%, right? 1 plus 0 0.1 powered by 3, do the cube, and that gives you 1,331. That's usually how we calculate. Now, if we know that equation, future, the relationship between F and P, we can obviously convert that to P equal to F right, P equal to F, and then this just become negative. This just, uh, N become, uh, the 
in front is a negative uh, symbol in front of n, right? So that's uh, if but if we have an interest and we have present value, how do we calculate future value? And the same thing if we have future value and then interest, how we calculate the present value or principle, right? Now we go back to the example we used before, right? A borrowed 10,000 from the bank for a personal loan. The yearly interest rate is still 5%. However, if you look at the difference between simple and compound interest, interests, you can see there's a big difference. You can see there's a big difference. So um, you see that for the simple interest, it's still straight line, right? And at the end of year 15, it's about 16,500. That's a total total uh, total amount you own the bank, right? 16,500. However, if the bank is using compound interest, and I'm telling you all bank use compound interest, right? No bank use simple interest. No one use simple interest. Bank use compound interest. And you can see that at the end, uh, of 15 years based on compound interest, same interest rate. The difference is pretty big already. The compound interest uh, already generates, uh, the, the total amount already over 20,000, already over 20,000. There's almost a 5,000 difference after 15 years, right? If we look at, at the end of 30 years, if based on simple interest, the amount you own the bank is $25,000, $25,000, right? But the amount, if based on compound interest, the amount you own uh, the bank is over $40,000, over $40,000. So you can see that after 30 years, um, the difference is gigantic. There's a big difference big difference and that's the power of compound interest right that's the power of compound interest the power means that it can be very beneficial right um, think about remember at the beginning of the class we talk about why how to how how to become a millionaire before you are 50 we said the safest way maybe the safest way is that you find a really good company who offers really good retirement uh, plan, which you know uh, help you to contribute a good portion uh, um, uh, to your uh, retirement plan, and then you start to invest invest into your retirement plan as much as you can, right? Try to maximize it or as much as you can. If you start early, thirty years for sure, you're going to get one million dollar in there. Right, for sure you're going to get one million dollar in there, probably even more, with the compound interest, with your money, with the principal you contribute. No way, that's one million. But with the compound interest, start to play its role. It's going to get you there. It's going to get you there, right? But also the power sometimes can harm you. Let's say um, the house. Let's say you got a mortgage, right? Maybe you only borrow a small amount of money. But uh, you, you, maybe you even lock a really good rate, really good interest rate. But after, if you need to 30 years to pay that, the bank is going to calculate, okay, this is how much money you owe me for 30 years. And you can find out that the interest is going to play a really big role. Maybe you only borrow a small amount and then add all the compound interest on top of it. That's become a huge amount, right? So dollar value, on dollar value, you're going to pay a lot. Um, and uh, another thing you may not even realize now is that the bank, when they give you a mortgage, they calculate everything. They calculate everything. But what I mean is that they already figured out, okay, you're going to pay me in 30 years. This is how much money. Maybe you borrowed 300,000 from me. But at the end of 30 years, you need to pay me $550,000. That's the total amount of money, right? Now, monthly, you're going to mail a check to me. I don't use that to pay your principal. 
if you pay your prince if you I use that to pay your principal, that's not going to generate a lot of interest anymore. I'm going to use that to pay a big portion are you used to pay for the interest rate and a small portion will be used to pay for your principal. And gradually, when you start to pay me more and more money, then each paycheck I receive the bank, pretend I'm a bank, right? The each paycheck I'm going to receive, small more amount will go to your principal and less amount going to your interest, right? That's how it works. So if you want to, this is maybe a little bit uh, uh, beyond the topic, but if you do get a mortgage, you want to pay down, pay down, pay whatever you own the money, own the, try to do this, right? Whatever the money you should pay the bank, pay that. Then maybe have some actual money each month, $100, $200, you mail that to or send that to the bank and specify this $200, I use it to pay for my principal. You reduce your principal, that's directly contribute to reduce your principal. You reduce your principal, you're going to generate, uh, the bank will generate less interest and then you can pay less, right? And that's the power of compound interest. Uh, I hope you have seen how big this is. 30 years, you, you saw it right here already, right? This is the compound interest. And this is, you know, most of the mortgage are 30 years, right? So it's going to make a very big difference. All right, here are some notation. Uh, AN here is a payment or receipt occurring at the end of an interest period. At the end of interest period, so basically, uh, at the end of first month, every month or every year, how much money you're going to pay uh, uh, the bank or how much money uh, the bank or I don't know, the employer, uh, the stock market will pay you, right? I is interest rate, N is total number of interest period, 10 months, 12 months or three years. P is a present value or present worth of the money. And F is future sum of money at the end of the analysis period. These are the notations we're going to use for our calculation right here, okay? Um, then there's the cash flow diagram. We already did a um, question on this probably, and you probably know this very well uh, from other classes before. So cash flow, is basically something like this, right? Um, you have the number, the number represents the time period. This can be years, one year, two years, three year, or one month, two months, three months, or quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, so on and so forth, right? Um, the present uh, expense, which is a cash outflow out of your pocket, they going down, those cash flow go down, right? And in here, at year zero, at the beginning of the period, 8,000 money goes out. Maybe that's the money you invest it to build your donut shop, right? $8,000. And then annually, you're making this much money. Annually, this you're making this much money. So each year, make $2,500 by selling donuts. Not a lot, obviously, just pretend it's a good example, right? So that's the money flowing. You're making that money, so that money goes up. Money goes up, the arrow goes up. Then the interest rate of loan is basically 10% here, 10% here, right? So the dashed, line, the dashed arrow line indicates amount to be determined the dash line of indicated amount to be determined. In this case, basically this is saying, okay, this is at year zero, you spend this much money. And then year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, you are making this amount of money, which is A. Then based on all this information, how can I calculate at the end of year five, how much will be the future money, future value, right, F. 
of this point. So that's a, a thing, the value you should determine, right? All right, here's one example. In 1626, right, Peter, well, this person paid $24 to purchase Manhattan Island. If he had invest, invested the $24 earning on the average of 8% per year, how much it will be worth in 2000? How much it will be worth in 2000? So here are four options to select. There's a dot, so you need to think about it. I'll give you two minutes to calculate and see which one of these four options are more close to a result. All right, now, um, Here's my calculation, right? We know the present value, which is $24. We know each year we increase by 8%, right? The interest rate is 8%. We know at N as 374 years from 1626 to 2000, right? And Based on this calculation, just this part generates this much of number. And the multiply by 24, that gives you this much. That gives you this much, right? So $75.9 trillion. In fact, just this is about $3 trillion. And all this is seventy-five point nine trillion dollar. Um, if you look at it data, the Man Manhattan's land value is an incredible. It's pretty high, but not this high. The Manhattan's uh, land value is based on the article from City Lab. It's about one point seven four trillion dollar. Still, that's a unbelievable. Unbelievable amount, right? 1.74 trillion. It's ca I cannot imagine, you know, somebody paid $24 to buy it three, 400 years ago. Okay, so future money have its value, present money have its value, right? So if, um, It's 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 a bit um it's bit a bit hard to believe, but forty based on the example we just saw before, right? If one person going to say okay, across four hundred years, how much money will be equal twenty four dollar equals to what amount of dollar currently? I'm going to say, well, one point seven four trillion dollar because $24 actually now generate equals to $1.74 uh, $1 trillion. That's, among, that's the value of Manhattan, right? So those, basically we're saying that those two numbers are equal. Those two numbers are equal, right? If money has a time flow, that's a question I'm asking. If the money has a time value, has a time value, how do we measure and compare various cash flows? How do we compare various cash flows? Because, you know, if in extreme cases, apart from 400 years, 1.74 trillion will be equal to $24. No way we can imagine that. No way I can compare that. How, how do I even expect that, right? So, however, in this case, it is true. Right, it is true because they show the same economic equivalence. Basically, that establish the one we are indifferent between a future payment or a series of future payments and the present sum of money. So today, if somebody asks me, uh, I can give you twenty-four dollar now, or I can 
in 400 years, I'm going to give you $1.74 trillion. I'm going to say, nah, just give me $24 now. I don't care. I don't want $1.74 trillion in 400 years. $24 is good for me now, right? So that's basically how we say they are equivalent. That's not going to interest me at all. Economic equivalence allows the comparison of alternative options or proposals by e reducing them to an equivalent basis. Equivalent basis depending on the interest rate, amount of money involved, timing of monetary receipts, or and or expenditures, or and or expenditures. Right. So obviously. Nobody can really compare $24 or $1.74 trillion, say, directly just say, okay, they're the same, right? So what you want to do, you either bring them to present value, we all bring to today to compare, right? Okay, 400 years you're going to give me $1.74 trillion, bring it now, bring it to the present value, how much that would be. That maybe give you $26. Oh, it's $26 is higher than $24. Okay, I can wait for 400 years, no problem. But if you give, when you do the calculation, you find out now nah, it's only five cents. I don't know, no, I don't, I don't want five cents. I'm just going to take your $24, right? Do the comparison, I know which one is more valuable, right? Or I can all convert that into future money. I can convert $24 and try to estimate in 400 years how much that will be and then make the best decision. I can convert them all to interest rate. That's go we're going to talk about that. But if one interest rate is higher than the other, then depending on we are borrowing or we are lending, we can make the best decision, right? Here's an example. You see a dog, I hope you see the dog and uh, take a minute to think about this example, right? So you are offered the alternatives of receiving either $3,000 at the end of five years or P dollars today. What value of P would make you indifferent between P dollars today and $3,000 in five years? Assuming interesting rate is 8%. Assuming interesting rate is 8%. So take a few minutes to think about it. We'll talk about it. All right. So you are offered in five years, you're going to get $3,000. That's your future amount, right? That's your future amount. We know to calculate the future amount, future amount equals to present amount multiplied by one plus I uh, powered by five, five years, right? That's, uh, that's how we calculate future amount. Then we can use this, do a little bit of manipulation and calculate present amount. So present amount equals to future amount divided by one plus I powered by five. Pretty uh, simple, right? Then do the calculation and you can find out that the, the result is $2,042, $2,042. Meaning that if you convert the $3,000 in five years to a present dollar amount now, the total value will be the total present value will be $2,042. So if someone going to give you 3,000 in five years compared to someone give you $2,042 now, it's indifferent. You can take some money now, or you can take, you can take the 2,000 to some dollar now, or say, it doesn't matter, I'll just wait. Um, in just give me $3,000 in five years, indifferent, right? But if someone at now offers you $2,050, even 
is $43, right? You're going to say, nice, I'm going to take that now. Even on dollar amount, obviously $2,043 is so much lower than $3,000. But because the interest, what is playing here, you're going to say that $2,043 is actually a better choice. It's actually a better choice, right? So here, $2,042 is equivalent to $3,000 received in five years from now at this interest. Are these cash flows equivalent at 10% of interest rate? Definitely not. Definitely not, right? Then we need, how much that will be? Then we need to use a 10% to calculate this. To use 10% to calculate this, right? Uh, some equivalent principles Comparing alternatives require a common time basis. Require common time basis. You can all convert them to year zero, or all convert them to year five, or convert them all to year one. Doesn't matter as long as they are all at the same time, then you can do the direct comparison. Also, equivalence depends on interest rate. That's it's very important, right? Interest rates change the value changes. Equivalent cash flows are equivalent at any point in time. If we are say they are here are the two equivalent cash flows, then at time zero, time one, time two, they're all the same. They require even more. Right? Uh, equivalence calculations may require the conversion of multiple cash flows to a single single cash flow. And we're going to see more examples related to that later. How do we convert multiple cash flows to a single cash flow? Uh, that's all for today's lecture. Talk to you next class.